Well, what I want to start off with is first I'm just going to point out what is up front here. We've got some uh, box samples of soils. This is our documentation, our formal documentation form for when we do the soil survey. And Klamath County soil survey is off and running. We've got an ongoing project we're working on. So these are some of the more colorful ones I thought I'd bring. So something to look at. We'll uh, talk, be talking about some of these in the presentation. I have some pictures of some of them also. So some brand new soils in Klamath County and we'll talk about those. Next thing I wanted to do is to find out a little bit about who I'm talking to before I launch into this. So I know what your background is with soil survey. So who has cracked open a soil survey book before? Very good. Uh, how about uh, who has who uses it regularly? Soil survey documents. Katie raised her hand. Very good. I use the T E U I. T that's good enough. T E U I soil Sergo. survey. Sergo. That's so that counts soil survey. Okay, so we got some pretty sophisticated users, and I'm just curious what you use it for mostly. What do you look up? If anybody wants to share. I used to use it for land management planning, and I was looking for soils that would be difficult to reclaim. Okay, so reclamation work. Uh huh. The soil types for plant, different plants grow, especially rare plants. Okay, so, so you're looking at the veg, the veg component. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I had a call the other day. Somebody called up and wanted to map the depth of the overburden between Klamath Falls and Quartz Mountain, and he wanted to do it with a soil survey. So. Whoa. That was a new one. It's pretty ambitious. I don't know how far he's going to get, but he sounded like he was serious. So there's lots of different uses for soil survey. So what I'm going to do today is I'll go through a little bit of the history of soil survey, uh, what it is, uh, kind of how it's evolved into what it is today. And then I'm mostly going to talk about the vegetation, because this is the plant society. I'm mostly going to talk about the vegetation component in soil survey and how we work with that data. So uh, we'll get started. This is a kind of a mix of a bunch of presentations that I've done over the years. So it's a little bit of a mishmash. And uh, it was one that I did on interagency collaboration to an uh, uh, interagency meeting with a bunch of different federal agencies and private folks who wanted to know about soil survey. <laughs> so we talked about that there's different products of soil survey. So you mentioned the TEUI, the Terrestrial Ecological Unit Inventory, or the EUI is another, sometimes we drop the T. Uh, the BLM has a product they call an ecological site inventory, an ESI. And there is, if you're familiar with the Gerber area, there is a ESI for the Gerber block BLM. It's not published, but it is out there uh, in a draft format. So there's a bunch of different tools. They all sort of get at the same thing. There's also what we call an SRI, a soil resource inventory that the Forest Service puts together. There are land type association maps, which is another kind of a soil data format. There's also, in this area, there's the Bureau of Indian Affairs put together a publication, uh, 1950s, 60s, I think, that was a soil survey document. It never got published. Uh, so there are a few hard copies floating around that got put together, but I don't think it went any further than that. But it's a very good document, uh, an early soil survey document with lots of good vegetation data as well. So. Uh, Further ado, some of the most common questions I get when I contact landowners to get permission is, these are the four most common questions. So hopefully, uh, by the end of this, you'll have some answers to these so that when I call you asking to get on your property, you won't have to ask me, what is soil survey? What do you map? What are we mapping? Why do we map it? Who cares? What are you looking for? Gold? Oil? What valuable minerals? No. Endangered species is a big one around here. Yeah, a lot of people very concerned about that. Uh, I've had people deny access because they're sure that I'm going to find endangered species. So that's a concern. We're not looking for endangered species. I don't know if I'd recognize one if I saw one. <laughs> <coughs> and then the question is, why bother? Why do we need a soil survey? So some of those questions we should be able to get. This is a retired soil scientist who uh, worked with this soil survey quite a bit. His name is Thor. This was his last uh, field trip down here to look at stuff. And this was a soil that we decided we didn't need anymore. And he filled in the hole and buried it for good. So it's a great picture. I had to share it. So soil survey is a scientifically based inventory. The publication looks a little bit like what you see there. 
Um, this is the document for the Klamath County Soil Survey. It's an old, this, this one is fairly old, it's out of date. Uh, we're updating portions of it and we'll probably update all of it eventually. And it's not published anymore. So <clears throat> they're gonna be a valuable commodity uh, at some point here. Collectible? They are almost a collectible. Hang on to it for a little while yet before it's worth anything. But, <clears throat> but don't pitch them if you've got one because they're not publishing them anymore. It's out of date. The official data for the Klamath County Soil Survey is now online. Uh, so that is a kind of a historical document. That book all has a lot of information in it which is not available online. And so it still is a really valuable resource uh, to keep a hold of. So typically in the East and in the Midwest, soil surveys have historically been done on a county by county basis. And out West, we do things a little bit differently. Uh, we don't really manage things on a county basis. So the soil survey boundaries are a little more fluid than that. They don't follow county lines uh, necessarily. There are 23,000 and counting different soil series. A series is the uh, kind of most defined grouping of a soil that we have. It's called a soil series. There are over 23,000 in the United States. We have five soil forming factors. Parent material, that's the geology. Climate, precipitation, temperature, um, that kind of thing. Living organisms, both flora and fauna influence the soil properties, topography, so the landforms, and time. <clears throat> All those things will influence what kind of soil we get. So if you were to make a map and you could overlay a map of all those things, all those different layers, you'd be pretty close to having a soil survey. So that's kind of what we're, that's what we're looking for, those five things. That's what we're mapping. And when we're out in the field looking, we are looking primarily at these properties here, color, texture, structure. Structure is uh, kind of how the soil holds itself together. Consistence, roots, pores, salts. We don't have a lot of that in the Wainema system, but we do further south of here, south, south of Klamath Falls. Rocks, rock content, how much rock is in the soil, what types of rocks, water, if there's a water table and some, some other properties as well. But those primarily is what we're, when I'm describing a soil, that's what I look at. And from those properties, we can usually figure out what type of soil it is and we can generate a whole bunch of interpretations on the soil. How deep do you go when you dig one of those? We go, so for soil survey, it's about six feet, five to six feet, 200 centimeters is how, how deep we go. So I typically dig a small hole and then hand auger the rest of it. So even though when we're out in the field, we're looking at those observable properties, this is really what we're mapping. So when we make a soil survey, we're, we can't really map soil color, right? Soil color is highly variable. You can go five feet apart, and it's gonna be a different color. You really can't map an exact amount of rock fragments. So we start grouping things. So a soil survey is a grouping of soil properties in order to get at some of the management concerns that we have with soils. So, and that's a very, kind of a confusing thing. So when you look at a soil survey document, you're looking at a polygon of soils that have similar properties for use and management. So that can vary a lot depending on what use and management we're talking about. If it's forestry management, that's one grouping of properties. If it's agriculture, that's another grouping of soil properties. So soil surveys will differ quite a bit depending on what the use and management is in the area. Um, but soil surveys get used in a lot of different things and we kind of talked about some of those. Anybody really who's worked with land management either personally or with a government agency almost always has to deal with soil survey data. So they get used quite significantly. And in county planning, especially in Klamath County, uh, they're getting looked at more and more closely right now. With water management in Klamath County, that's a soil survey is an issue. I just found out that the Bureau of Reclamation uses the water table in that old book, the water table data, in order to generate their payment rates for the water bank program. Oh. Which I had, I had no idea that that, that the data in there is tied to that much dollars. Yeah. 
And it's kind of scary because that data that is in an old document has changed quite a bit. So very interesting. There's the, the soil survey, I'm always surprised how far the soil survey data gets used. I'm going to go just a little bit about soil survey history. Soil survey, the, the first soil survey was back uh, in the late 1800s when, when we did the first soil survey in the United States. Uh, and it was by special act of Congress and it was on a tobacco farm. So they were looking at soil fertility for tobacco farming. And it was a very special case, farm by farm basis. Uh, somebody who had some pull with Congress could get their soils looked at. That's how they, that's how they started. And from there, uh, it turned into more uh, looking at wider agricultural uses. So it initially started as, a, as a, an agriculture based system. Everything changes in the Dust Bowl in the 1930s when we had serious soil erosion problem. And all of a sudden, we needed to know where the problems were, where we had susceptible soils, soils that were susceptible to erosion. And so the emphasis changed from mapping ag lands to mapping problem areas for soil erosion and to figuring out what we could do about it. So that was the 1930s. Later, World War II comes along, and all of a sudden, the focus shifts again. And now with soil survey, we're really more concerned about uh, food resources and where are our valuable lands for producing food. Uh, so that shifted again, soil survey refocused again a little bit. 1960s, things start to change again with a lot of um, urban urbanization. And with that comes all the interpretations that go along with urbanization, roads, uh, septic tanks, environmental concerns. And so soil survey shifts again now, and now we're also looking at a whole new suite of interpretations for urbanization. And then in the 1980s, uh, 18, 1980s, 1990s, and up until now, we're looking at increased computer modeling ability, digitization of all the products, so that the maps are all digitized now, the databases are all digital, and that changes everything, because now we've got all kinds of modeling capabilities. Lots of more questions that we can ask. And with that, then comes some nesting of the soil properties that we can look at. So we can zoom in and out to look at different soil properties. So again, 1930s, we start real broad. We're looking at problem areas. We're looking at mapping areas that are susceptible to erosion. 1960s, we shift again. Now we're talking about a whole new set of interpretations for urbanization. And then up into the 2000s, we're, now we're starting to look at nesting different soil properties in order to model different uh, use and management, different um, interpretations. So we can nest properties and we can zoom in and out. So we can look at broad scale, we can look at a real, like a farm scale, we can do real intensive agriculture. So that's soil survey history in a nutshell. We got any questions so far? If not, I'm going to move on and talk about some other stuff. Anybody? Nobody. Okay, very good. So soil survey starts with point data. This is the shoe cache soil, which we have up front. Uh, it's a very common soil on the Wainema National Forest. What you see is this is the Mount Mazama ash overburden. And down here is a buried soil. That's the old uh, volcanic base before Mount Mazama blew. As you get closer to the source of this ash, this contact goes deeper and deeper and deeper, and pretty soon we're into well over 200 centimeters of pumice, this stuff up here. So this soil happens all around, kind of along the edge of the Mount Mazama plume, the ash plume that came out. So this is real coarse pumice. It's not the fine ash you see in Idaho, you hear so much about, they've got a real fine uh, layer of ash. It, this is coarse, real coarse sands and gravels, pumice gravel. So in soil survey, this is our base of everything is the pedon description, we call it pedon, it's a soil profile description. And because of this ability to nest things and zoom in and out, we can go all the way up to this very coarse scale. So we'll just, I'll just highlight a few of those. <clears throat> Here's a map of all the point data that we have laboratory data on in the United States. So there's a lot, we have a national lab in Lincoln, uh, Nebraska. And all this data is stored there. It's also available online. You can go look at an area, see if we've collected lab data in there, and uh, download the lab data. So it's a pretty powerful database they've got set up. And again, this is the most basic, the, the, 
largest scale of soil data that we have, point data. If you zoom way out, here's the coarsest map that we've got. And again, this is, this is the NRCS model of soil survey. There are other uh, groupings that we can talk, we can talk about land types. There's different categorizations, different classifications, scales of mapping, but in this soil survey model, we're talking about land resource regions is the largest thing. Uh, and you can see they're huge. This is a continental scale. So again, you know, to, to look at the properties of one of these polygons, you have to be looking pretty broadly. We're really talking, you know, broad geology, broad landforms, broad climate groupings. So if you zoom in to this land resource region, they're really on a county scale. They're pretty massive. The minimum size delineation is 560,000 acres for one of these land resource regions. So they're, they're huge. And that's the smallest scale way up here. All right. So if we zoom in, we've got another layer. Some of you, anybody heard of StatsGo data? Yes. Anybody else? You have. Katie is a soil scientist that just started with NRCS, so she's answering yes to everything, and that's great. <laughs> she has heard of it all, so that's very good. If she doesn't know what it is, she better just say yes anyway. Um, so StatsGo data, the minimum size delineation, I don't know if you can see it down there, is 50, about 1,500 acres. So again, useful for managing vegetative communities? Probably not. I mean, a lot can happen in 1,500 acres. but. This data is very easy to use. It's seamless across the United States. It looks like when you zoom into it, it'll say it's got a soil name and it'll give a broad vegetative grouping. So people are very tempted to use this data. It's easy to model. And I see this data get misused quite a bit. So if you're tempted to use stats, go make sure you remember minimum size down here is 1,500 acres. So if you need to know anything more detailed than that, stats go is not, not what you want. It's also called the general soil map, if you've heard of that. So a detailed soil survey is down below StatsGo, down here. And this is what we're all used to. This is the published soil survey document. Minimum size delineation is about six, five to six acres in this. Useful for vegetation management? Probably. I would think so. I mean, a lot can happen. You can have things change within five acres, but uh, you can start to talk about management schemes at, the, at that level. You'd still need a ground truth that you still need to do an on-site investigation, but we're getting closer. All right, so this is what's in a soil survey. We kind of talked about this a little bit. There's text descriptions, there's lots of interpretations, lots of tables of the soil properties, and of course maps. The official place for soil survey data is now Web Soil Survey. Any of these books are now considered out of date because they make updates to the interpretations, we refine lines a little bit, it's all online. We can't publish the document, we can't publish the books fast enough anymore. It's too expensive. So the official data is all online. Web Soil Survey. Anybody ever use Web Soil Survey? One, two, yes, Katie, good. So we got three. So Web Soil Survey, if you have not used it, it's a really cool uh, tool. You can uh, generate maps, you can zoom in and out, you can look at a specific property. You can make maps not only just of the soil type, but you can make maps of the vegetative communities. You can make maps of soil properties. If you want to know the bulk density of the surface layer, you can make a map of bulk density. You can make a map of the overburden, like this request that we had. So, another pause for questions. Anybody on this stuff? If you ask the question, is that thing going to attack you? Or? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You figured it out. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll talk now about the, the soil survey in this area. The, um, so in the, the blue lines are Klamath County. You can see the county lines. This blue area down here is the published soil survey. The red stuff around it is the Wyneema National Forest area. And this over here is the Fremont National Forest. Now, when we first started on this project, the Fremont and the Wyneema were two separate forests. Now they're one administrative unit. So we're working on the Wyneema portion. We have not done much on the Fremont right now. So the current project is to map the Wyneema National Forest, and that's called a TEUI, Terrestrial Ecological Unit Inventory, because it's Forest Service land. And we're also, this piece here, we are updating. So that's a published, so published Klamath County, but this northern piece of it we're updating. 
So we're not going to update this southern part just yet, but this is going to get updated. And the reason is because this includes some of the Wainema, Fremont Wainema National Forest is included in this northern published part. And the forest, at the time we were do setting this project up, the forest really wanted to have their whole forest updated. So that's why we're doing it. And that's why we're not doing this down here right now, although it needs it. So um, Crater Lake National Park has also got a soil survey here. And a lot of these other areas, this one just got published a couple years ago. That's out. Umpqua National Forest, we have nothing. Uh, no soil survey anyway. I think there's an SRI, but no soil survey. This we've got uh, is, I believe, um, not mapped. It's Deschutes. So we've got a lot of work to do, mostly in the forest, in the public lands. We'll skip that. Um, so again, here's our project area. This is our existing project area. The purple is our boundary. The white line is the published soil survey, and everything in here we're updating as part of our project. You can see the green is the Forest Service lands. This is a map showing our progress so far. The blue is done. We've mapped it. We have a database in various stages of completion. The cross-hatched area is the Forest Service lands. So you can see most, 99% um, of the Forest Service lands are mapped. They're not published yet. They're not on a web soil survey. We can't put the whole thing up on web soil survey until we get everything done. So you can see where I have work to do is Wood River Valley, Klamath Marsh National Wildlife Refuge, and some in the Sprague Valley area. So Katie will finish that up, and we'll get it published. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip through these. These are graphs showing our progress. Here's some of the soils. That, this is a map of andesols. So andesols are soils, volcanic soils. We've got a lot of them in Klamath County. The purple is an andesol. The light purple is kind of a, it's a well, it's a vitrandic subgroup, or um, doesn't quite make andic soil properties, but it's, it's got uh, andic characteristics. Volcanic soils, either they're too weathered to make andic soil, you know, the, the andic materials have weathered out. So we've got some of that down in this area, uh, some around the lake here, I think, as well. And then up here is another one I want to talk about a little bit later. This is a, a spotosol that we've mapped, and that's brand new soil to the Klamath County. I'll show some pictures of that. The green is either histosols or uh, sapris or hemists, and those are organic soils. And we're going to find more when we finish mapping down here and here. Okay. So another unique soil we have in the Klamath Basin: diatomaceous soils. Diatomaceous soils are formed. They're uh, not very widespread, but we have a lot of them in this area. And there's two sources of diatoms. The diatoms are the blue-green algae in the lakes, in the waters. And when they settle out in the bottom, in the sediments, their shells, this is a shot of one of them. They're pretty variable. They a lot of different forms and shapes. But their shells settle out, and they're silica. They make their shells from silica, which is why we have so many of them, because we've got well, the volcanic influence of silica from the ash. So they got a good source of silica. Uh, it's cold here. They like cold water and lots of silica. And so we've got a lot of diatoms in the water. The blue-green algae, if you take blue-green algae supplements from here. Uh, and they make very unique soil properties that we have scratched our heads over quite a bit. Um, physical properties, the water movement through these soils is like nothing else. It's very different from what we would normally see in a similar textured soil. So we've done a lot of studies on diatomaceous soils. There's two sources of the diatoms. One is the current forming diatoms, and the other one is in the sedimentary, old sedimentary rock that's got some diatomaceous materials in it, diatomite. This is uh, the southern end of the county. I want to talk a little bit about the variability in the plant communities and in the climate. So this is the warmest, driest area in the, in the project that we're working on. So Mount it's... Mountain. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... It's warm enough, you can grow crops. We've got cropping interpretations here. And then we go all the way up to some pretty cold, uh, cold areas, cold and wet precipitation also. So we go, we have a pretty broad range. We go from mesic temperature regime 
all the way up to Cryic in this area. Um, and the plant communities vary quite a bit as well by that temperature zone. So this is Mount Thielsen, and in the wilderness areas we've got relatively undisturbed vegetative communities, and then we also go to highly manipulated, highly disturbed communities. So the vegetation is a huge challenge across the temperature zone. And then if you overlay precipitation onto temperature, you get even more variability. We go from, you know, 10 to, what do I have, about 15 inches annual precipitation all the way up to just about 70 inches on the far western, you know, as you get into the Cascades. So that's a big spread. And the vegetation changes quite a bit. Are you updating the soil surveys with the new relative annual precipitation? Have you guys done that around here yet? We're not doing the relative effective precip, that one. We are not going to incorporate that. I did, when I worked in Colorado, we were doing that. We're doing it in Montana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a lot of uses for it, especially in dry areas where you get, you know, aspect makes a big difference. Uh -huh. But we're not uh, incorporating it. What we, what we are doing is instead of calling, instead of using relative effective precip, we're doing, um, we'll do phases. Okay. So we'll say the precip might look the same for different veg communities, but we'll call it a moist phase mm -hmm. or a dry phase. And that's how we get at it, rather than tinker with the... Yeah, that's cool. Uh, it's a little bit simpler. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. Uh, here... Another question related. Oh, yeah. Are, where are you getting those precipitation data from? That, that was prism data. Okay. Mm -hmm. That seems awfully high. It is. I'm not quite sure we really get that much. Yeah. But, but again, that's the, that's the high, high end. So... Uh, that's a prism data. It's modeled, and so that's what we use. I think that's about the best thing we've got. It's we interpolated, do interpolated, right? Yes, interpolated. Very good. Yeah, it's uh, and there's um, there are a lot of weather stations around as well. So we've we've got data that we use from there. When the soil survey goes to publication, we also publish uh, climate data from the different weather stations. That gets included in the soil survey as well. So uh, there's a couple different data sources in the soil survey for that. This is a lodgepole forest. It's some of the coldest, driest stuff we have. Um, also heavily managed. Most of it's been cut over. Not a lot of species diversity here. Uh, <clears throat> and this stuff goes for acres and acres and acres. This is the coldest, wettest area we have. This is Klamath Marsh National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, and the waters are cold. The properties of the pumice, the thermal properties of the pumice, this volcanic ash that we have, it does not conduct heat very well at all. So for a similar uh, latitude and elevation elsewhere, we would see a lot warmer signature. Vegetation would look like, it would look very different. It would look like warmer vegetation than we have here. And the reason is because the pumice in this area does not hold heat. So during the day when the sun hits it, it doesn't warm up, it doesn't conduct heat. And because of that, we have cold soils, cold air, cold air drainages at night. When the sun goes down, things are cold. Uh, and that's a property, in part, that's related to the pumice. It also has to do with the proximity of the mountains. Uh, but the water is cold, soils are cold, and uh, we have some cold stuff. So there's some new soils that we have in the Klamath Marsh as well. And we have manipulated hydrology, which is very hard to capture in a soil survey. make some interesting problems. So I want to talk a little bit, across, on, the, on both shores of Klamath Lake, we've got huge differences in the soils. The parent material is different, the um, vegetation is different, climate's different, both temperature and precip differ a little bit, and the soils look vastly different. Up here, we've got one soil that's called Sky Lake. It's very red. A lot of the soils on the west side are older volcanic deposits, and they tend to be redder than as you go uh, to the east and north. And I want to look at, so this is taken from Modoc Rim, looking over the lake, and I want to look at a soil, a new soil that we set up. So this is an update area. This is in the published soil survey. Uh, it's included in that area. And this, um, this scarp, this hill, is mapped. Oh, I can't remember now. I think it's a, they've, they've included a very deep soil in this soil map unit, and they've captured this rocky stuff. It's called like a rock outcrop. We also call it a rubble land if it's loose rock. Uh, and so that's, that's what they've mapped it as. But we started looking at it and we realized that these zones here 
with this shrubby stuff. If you get in there, uh, well, it looks different just looking at, at the landscape. And when we started digging, sure enough, there's totally different soils between this stuff and this are very vastly different. Mm -hmm. Lots of organic matter in here, very deep soils. Uh, some, uh, some of the most amazing species diversity I've seen <laughs> on, in this area is in these little pockets. We got snails and grubs and birds and it's just teeming. And so we started looking, we thought, well, this is a pretty cool spot. There's a lot going on. We should probably capture it. And sure enough, the soils are very different. So we set up a brand new soil for this. It's called um, kind of in this shrubby zone around the rubble land. So the soil is called shrubble. <laughs> and then that should come out shrubble. Mm -hmm. This is a Modoc rim? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's another I've shot. I've never walked down to look at those areas, but you can always see, you know. Well, place. they're hard to get into. Yeah. I about killed myself with rocks yeah. falling. It's. Yeah. I'm not going back. And I've, done li I've done lichens in some of those, and, and once you get in it, it's smooth sailing. Yes. It's getting through there. Yeah. To, yeah, you can stand, and the, the stuff that's in there, it's an entirely different world than two feet outside it. it, it yeah, it's, it's 180 degrees, very different. You think those areas didn't burn, or why do you think all the organic build up there? Well, I think there's, I think the water, it's, it's some kind of a discharge area, hydrologically. Oh. That's what I think. So somehow, I, I, I don't quite understand it very well. I'm sure a hydrologist could explain it better, but somehow there's a, a water discharge all around these fields. Historically or currently? I think currently. It's not, it's not a wet soil, but there's enough moisture right around here. So my guess is, you know, the water's running off and it hits this rocky stuff. So we've got small soil pores here, large pores or no pores here. As the water's moving through the soil, whenever, whenever water hits a textural break in soil, it slows or stops. And that's probably enough for these plants to get hold of it. That's my guess. So is this the side that's facing the lake or is this back, that other? This is facing the lake. Okay, uh -huh. so this is right there. This is that road. What road is it? Above Hagelstein Park that goes up? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right there. Okay. How did they form originally? The soils? Yeah. Any ideas? Well, the organic builds up from the plants. Yeah. So the plants fill in. And when you, when you get into these things, it's, uh, it's large voids and it's very loose material uh, and it's organic. So I have a box sample of it here so you can look at it. Um, it's almost all rock. We call it a fragmental soil. It's, it's almost over 90% rock and just a little bit of soil kind of in the cracks between the rocks. But it's enough to support all this. So, so the, the, you know, these are rocks that have fallen down off the slope. And over time, that's one of the five soil forming factors, over time the organics build up enough to create a soil. The other, we had a, we had a difficulty because there's another soil very similar to this, same, same landscape, same vegetation pattern, and they recognized it as well. It's on the Columbia Gorge on those steep slopes, they've got the same vegetative pattern, and they set up a soil there as well. So when we started looking, I thought, oh, well, we've already got a soil that we can use, so I don't get to have this cool new soil here. But it turns out the climate is different enough that we really, we do, we should recognize two different soils. So, so we've got our own here. It's kind of a neat story. So, so is that something that the, the basin could use as a, a a tourism attractant. We have soil here that's different from <laughs> It's really cool new soil. I suppose you could. There's lots of new soils here. I think they'd be a great. I've taken tours of the Oregon Soil Science Society has come out and looked at some of these new soils, and they really get jazzed when they see. You know, if you go out east, uh, the east coast and the Midwest, when they look at uh, the soil surveys out there, it made national news when they they found a new soil in the I think it was the Blue Mountains or something out east. National news. Huge deal. They had senators go out. I mean, it was a big deal. We're, we've got dozens of new soils just in this project area alone. If we did the kind of press coverage every time we found a new soil here, it'd be, uh, we'd never get anything done. <laughs> you would have trouble here, though, making this a big, there are some very uh, significant cultural resource uh, history along this slope, so uh, you probably don't want people traipsing all over it. But. So, uh, but it is, it's a really neat area, and those those zones are uh, unlike anything else I've seen. They're really neat. How do you decide, how do you choose a place to go look at? 
That's a good question. So we do, when we're, when we're doing the maps, we do what we call a pre-map, and we set up, uh, so we look at those five soil forming factors, and we, that's the hypothesis part. So we develop a hypothesis of where we think the soils are going to change. So I would look at that slope, and I would say, okay, I know this is the landscape, and then I'd start looking at vegetative patterns. And if there's a vegetation change, almost always there's a soil change. Now, just because there's a different vegetation doesn't mean you want to separate it out. It has to be a management concern. So if there's an issue, and this one there is, right, there's wildlife uh, management, there's uh, vegetation management concerns in those shrub zones that we might want to get a handle on someday. So, so then I would look at where the differences in vegetation and landforms and climate are, and then those, that's where I would go look at the two, so that's the hypothesis that there's a difference, and then I'd go dig some holes and characterize what I'm seeing. Uh, this is another really cool soil. A, this is the spot of soil I was talking about. We suspected that they were here. They've, they found them on the Willamette uh, National Forest and coming over, uh, over the mountains, but we just hadn't looked for them over on this side yet. So this, we did find this one. It was uh, another soil scientist who was working here who found it. I was going fast and furious and not really paying much attention. And, she was a new soil scientist and really excited, and she dug a hole, and she said, oh my gosh, I think this is something new. And I said, ah, it's just pumice. Move. Go. But she said, no, I think it's different. And she kind of dug her feet in a little bit, and uh, turned out, yep, sure enough, it was that spot of soil, and it turns out we've got quite a bit of it. It's unique to the hemlock forests. It doesn't, we don't find it anywhere else. It's only in the hemlock zone. So high precipitation, and it's under this dense, uh, hemlock leaves that real dense litter. And that's where this thing. So, what is. does spotosol mean? So, spotosol is, that's a good question. This spotosol, it means an accumulation. Now, I don't know if you can see this very well. Can you see this reddish color here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, there's a gray zone here. This is, the, this is the hemlock forest litter, that dense mat. Then we got this gray zone, and then we got reddish. And that's, that's what defines a spotosol, is those, those bright color contrasts. And what it is, is it's a zone of accumulation of aluminum and, and uh, well, sometimes iron, but aluminum and organic complexes that pile up, that accumulate here. And so that takes, and there's, I think we're still trying to understand it. There's an, there's, the current thinking is that as the aluminum and iron build up in the solution, they, they become soluble. When they reach a certain point, they start precipitating out, and that's what causes this. So it's a unique set of, they form in wetlands, you'll see them in wetlands a lot. Usually it's wet and cold is where you see them. So that's what the spotosol is, and they're here, this reddish orange stuff. Now ours are, there are some much more colorful spotosols out there, but this is about as colorful as it gets in the pumice zone. So. What are those never, never represented? Those are centimeters. Centimeters. It's a depth tape. Mm -hmm. So this was a brand new soil. We decided at the time it's really not worth setting up a brand new series for, so we're calling it this uh, tax adjunct. To, there's a similar, very similar soil uh, that does not have this orange accumulation, and so we're calling this that soil, but with a spot accumulation, rather than set up a whole new soil. And the reason is we just don't have a whole ton of it. As we get into the Umpqua National Forest, if we ever get over there, we'll probably find more of it. And at that point, we'll look at capturing a broader range in characteristics and set up a brand new soil for it. So these are some of the diatomaceous soils that we have. These are, um, Wocus Bay is a brand new soil. That's in the Klamath Marsh and also in the Wood River Valley. Hoxie is an older soil that they recognized in the original mapping, but we've learned a lot more about it. And Chinchalo is an old soil that they've known about for a while, but we're learning quite a bit more. These soils, when you feel them, they feel like a silt, but water moves through them. It, it, it almost is impermeable to water, even though so it acts like a real heavy clay. Is that big meadow? What's that? Is that big meadow? Yeah. Uh, uh, up by Pelican Butte? It's up by Pelican Butte. I'm not sure which one it is. I think it is. That's, that's, we did a field trip there one time, and a soil guy was with us. Jim Doerr? Might have been. And yep. he took, he took it easy. and wet it and stuff and then started stretching it. Yeah. And yep. it got like 
like an elastic band, and he just took this little ball and, and had it stretched out like this big. And yeah, they are just amazing soils. They really. Yeah, that that is because this is the this is at, right near a pit that he described, so it probably was that one. Mm -hmm. So all the white stuff around here. Mm -hmm. That's diatomaceous material too, isn't it? That white rock. Yeah. Yeah, they call it chalk rock. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that's, a, that's an old sedimentary deposit. This is new, you know, this is a new, right. but yeah, that's got, that's got diatoms. So is that impermeable to water also, or how does that work? Because I certainly have it in my yard. Yeah, that stuff, <laughs> that stuff soaks up water like it does soak up nothing water. else. It, and so that has like, and, and that's the thing, is it's almost impermeable, but it, it, the water holding capacity is like 150% by weight. It'll hold that much water. So when you have clay over that, you really have a lot of... Yeah. Water your capacity. Yes, and no water movement. <laughs> yes, it'll sit. And so we don't know what we think. What's going on is the pores in those diatoms are so small, and they're platy, so they orientate, orient, flat, and that's what holds up the water. Well, it seems like roots grow right through it. Roots will, and a lot of times they're going. Well, it depends where you're at, but a lot of times they'll grow horizontally. Uh, especially if you go up in the marsh, not many root, well, maybe that's a water effect too, that the roots don't go down that low. But yeah, the roots will go into it, but water almost stops. So if you go, if you, if you were to go up around Klamath Marsh and auger a hole down through, uh, so here's the pumice is down here. So a lot of times you get this diatomaceous silt over a mineral soil, diatomaceous, or a, of an ashy, coarse sand. If you, when it's wet, there's be ponded water up here. You can put an auger through here. This is, this pulls out, it's not saturated, it's dry. And then you get into the pumice down here. If you go through that with an auger, the water will come up. It's, it's under artesian pressure. So this stuff in here is both keeping the water underground and perching it. Um, so it's a pretty unique critter. I think I'm almost out of time. What time do we want to go tell? You can, well, you can go until you're done. Okay. I can go a lot longer. I wow. could be. <laughs> ten we'll give it up ten minutes. Okay. Uh, this is another area where we've got some new soils. These are the, um, some of the seasonal wet spots up on the basalt tablelands. Uh, yeah. And uh, a new soil we set up here is called Big Top. This was another. Jim Dore was a soil scientist on the Forest Service. A lot of you might know him and his crew. And they recognized this soil and mapped it quite extensively on some of the fringes of the basalt tablelands. That's a real heavy clay soil. So that's, a, that's also a new soil that we set up. You did the, the soil thing at the, for the land trust in the Vernal Pool, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that the same soil as that? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's right. In fact, this is nearby that. Okay. It's right in that same area. Yeah. And they're small little pockets, but they are significant. So. The other thing we've done, which is, is kind of interesting, it, so this is the Sycan River coming down, and where it dumps out into the Sprague Valley, uh, and they knew about this, they mapped it in the old soil survey, uh, but I'm not sure they knew why, but there's a soil right at the end of this thing where it dumps out, it's called the Sycan soil, and it's a coarse, sandy, dry, droughty soil in the middle of the Sprague Valley, which has a lot of water in it. And what they have learned is that it was, there was an outburst flood that came down, so somehow there was a dam at, shortly after Mount Mazama, and it broke, it probably from all the pumice, broke and we had a massive flood push down through here and dump out into the Sprague Valley, uh, depositing a huge sand, kind of a fan, out in the Sprague Valley. So that's another thing that we've done, uh, now that we understand that, we've got some, and we've got better imagery and uh, GIS capability, so we've got a better map of that. So it forms sort of a delta. Yeah, uh -huh. and it's, you know, you look at it and it looks about the same level if you're just standing on it, about the same level as the rest of the valley, but it's a totally different soil and very dry. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll end with the temperature study. This is a study that we're doing because soil temperature is so important. It affects a lot of different things. It talks about, uh, affects the vegetation, both the type, the amount, the production, the variability. Um, and it also impacts soil taxonomy when we classify soils. So we've started a study where we installed a bunch of these little 
soil temperature loggers here around the project area to get an idea of what's going on with soil temperature. We've got some startling results, and I don't know how we're going to handle them yet. But some of the study questions, we had six study questions that we were looking at, are looking at. Most of it has to do with this, called the cryic frigid break. And that is the different, so cryic is the coldest of the cold. Frigid is a little bit warmer than cold. So we've got, um, and the vegetation differs considerably between the two. So within the pumice zone, there's a transition going from super cold, and you can see it in the vegetation, that's how we know it's there. And we think it has to do with temperature. But we don't have, we can guess, we can guess what the temperature is, but we don't have any quantitative numbers on that. So we're trying to get some. So that's pumice zone. Also, within the Wood River Valley, the wetlands, uh, in the bottom of the valley, we know up north it's cold, and as you move south, you can start to grow crops. So there's a change there. In the old soil survey, that was all one temperature regime, but we think there's enough differences for cropping potential to show up, which also affects the reimbursement rate if you're enrolling in a wetland restoration program with NRCS. So there's dollars tied to this, and so we need to figure out what's going on, and if that's really a significant difference. And also in the Cascade Mountain Zone, we've got, we go from cryic to frigid, the, the uh, Shasta fir zone, and then as you come down into the mixed conifer zone, we think that's temperature related, not more temperature than moisture. And so we need to figure that out as well. And then along Modoc Rim, we go all the way from down south where it's mesic, and you get up north and we know it's cryic, but it's, we want to know if that's really what's going on on that, on that ridge line as well. And then within the Andesols, we've got Lodge Polo expressions, Ponderosa expressions, and White Fur Grand Fur expressions. And we think they're mostly temperature related. But again, we don't have anything quantitative. Is it big enough to make a taxonomic break or small enough that we should just call it a phase? Do we need new soils? So a lot of questions on that uh, thing as well. So we have 27 sites that we're monitoring all around the forest and private lands both. 27 sites, 23 different soils. So some soils we've got the same soil but vegetative phases and we're putting some temperature sensors in there. And this is the kind of data we get. So this is in the Wood River Valley. Kirk soil, which is an old, old soil. They recognize that in the old soil survey. The surprising thing is, now we, only, we don't have much data, so I really, I probably shouldn't go out on a limb, but the surprising thing is these things are way warmer than we thought they were, like a, like a whole taxonomic class warmer than we thought. And it's happened every year for five years running. Now, if you're talking about temperature regimes, you really need to be looking more like a hundred year time frame. So this is silly to look at just five years. So we're really not going to make temperature regime decisions on this, but it is going to be valuable for seeing if there's a significant difference if that's what's influencing the vegetation changes that we're seeing or if it's something else. All right, I think I should probably wrap this up. We got more to talk about, but here's just an example in the Sprague Valley. I'll do this one real quick. Sprague Valley, uh, Sprague River Valley, this is the old soil survey here and this is the new, the new, the yellow lines are the new mapping overlaid on the old. So you can see the, we've got a lot more resolution and part of that has to do not because the soils have changed, but just because we're looking at different things. So we're much more concerned now with hydrology than we were in the 1940s and 50s when they mapped this. At the time they mapped this, if anything had a little bit of water in it, well, you flagged it as wet, we got to drain the water off. That was the concern. So in the original soil survey, the whole Sprague Valley is considered a wetland. It, from side to side, it's all hydric soils, it's wetland, it, it's a jurisdictional wetlands according to the uh, soil survey manual. But we know that not all of it is that wet. But again, it's just because our management priorities have changed, and so we can do that when we update the soil survey. So this has uh, changed quite a bit. Here's a map that shows the dark green in the old soil survey is the hydric soil units, considered a wetland soil, and this is the new mapping. So you can see the change in hydric soils that we've got documented. That's, that's going to be a big change. Okay, I think we should quit.
I could go on, but I think we should probably quit. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be here all night. Is there any other questions anybody's got? What I wanted to talk a little bit about was plant associations versus ecological site descriptions. Um, so if anybody's got questions or concerns about that, I could hit that real quick. But, um, we're using both in this soil survey. So if you've, anybody familiar with those ecological site descriptions? You must be, plant associations, Katie is of course. So there's lots of differences between uh, the two but we're using them both in this soil survey. So they, the published document should have both of those in there. And is that so different agencies can use them? Yes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes. So you're measuring soil temperature at 50 centimeter depth? That's the, integrating yep. over the top 50 centimeters or just after? We time? measure it right at 50 centimeter depth. Okay. And the reason is because that's what we use to classify soils. It's a taxonomic. Okay. And we, how are you putting those probes in the ground? It's an auger hole. Okay. And then, uh, is that what you mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we I auger mean, down. I measure soil water frequently, uh -huh. and so I was just curious how it's different from the probes that you're using. Yeah, these are just, they're just, we saw the picture, they're just little plastic units. Yeah. And I saw an auger hole, and then push it into the side, usually, okay. and then fill the hole back in. And the batteries seem to last about two years before I have to go back and dig them up again. Are they wireless or I guess? No, I have to dig it up. To, okay. I have to pull the thing out to download it and change the battery. Every time you download it? Uh -huh. oh, okay. Well, I only download it when I need to change the battery. Because sure. it's just too much work. We also have piezometer. We've got a water table study going as well. So we have a lot of water table data. All right. Yes? Could you tell a little bit about your background and what you're doing now? Oh, yeah. yeah. I probably should have said that at the beginning. So uh, my background is I uh, went to school in Indiana. I grew up in Minnesota. Went to college in Indiana, uh, biology, chemistry, psychology. Uh, from there, I went to uh, joined Peace Corps. I worked in Africa for a couple years doing agroforestry. Came back to the United States, wanted to do agroforestry, and ended up taking some soils classes and decided I needed to focus on soils. So that's how I got into soil survey. I've worked in northern New Mexico and Arizona on the Navajo Reservation with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, mapped soils there. I uh, mapped soils in Colorado with the NRCS, and then came here, and have been here about 10 years working for NRCS, doing wetland determinations and soil survey and this project we're working on now is a joint project between the Forest Service and NRCS so that's kind of nice we get to work with uh, two different crews very nice presentation okay Thank you.